On December 4th, 1972, Stephen Stainer disappeared from his home in Merced, California without a trace. While his family continues to desperately search for their son, Stephen's new life as Dennis Gregory Parnell begins. It would be a life that many people who've suffered abuse can attest to. One filled with normalcy, like school, friends, and sports, and another hidden from view, filled with terrifying abuse. Join us as we continue covering the life and kidnapping of Stephen Steiner in this episode, Dennis Parnell. Welcome to the third part in our series on the life and kidnapping of Stephen Stainer. With me is Sean and Charles. How are you gentlemen doing this evening? I'm doing excellent. Yeah, really great. Last episode, we covered the beginning of the kidnapping of Stephen Stainer and mainly focused on the search his family, the police, and the town of Merced conduct to find any trace of Stephen and any clue of what might have happened to him. This episode, we're going to change gears and discuss Stephen's life with his kidnapper, Kenneth Parnell. And Stephen really had a very different experience than that of his family. The place I got most of the information for this episode tonight came from articles after Stephen is, I, I hate to use the word found, found's the wrong word, but it comes from those articles. So they're various. You can see, we'll put it up on our website where we got everything. During the first few days after Stephen was kidnapped by Parnell and Murphy, the trio stayed in Kathy's Valley at a cabin that Parnell had rented. Near to where they were staying in Kathy's Valley, Stephen Stainer's grandfather lived. There is no evidence that Stephen ever knew where he was or that he was near to his grandfather. He, they spent most of their time inside. Uh, it was really snowy in that area at the time, so it might have looked different as well if he happened to look outside. I think like a seven-year-old, I mean, you're driving, even though it's, what, 25 minutes? Is that what we said about Kathy's Valley? It's about 25 from, yeah, around 20 there? 20 minutes or so, yeah. 20 minutes. That's still like, a for a seven-year-old, that's... A long trip, and they probably weren't paying attention. They were scared. So he doesn't even know that he's by his grandpa's house, probably. Yeah, I think he would probably know a little more if he was in Merced, where he might have been. But going that far away would have been totally different. And like you said, he's frightened, so he's not really thinking straight. And this is a weird coincidence that they end up in a place where he has a family member. Um, but if we think back to how interconnected this area is to the mountains, I know I have a lot of family members if you go up that way all along the path. We've talked about it before, the interconnected, interconnectivity of this area with the highway systems and then their proximity to Yosemite. That It's a coincidence, but it's not that much of a coincidence. Yeah, it's not super unlikely. Right. While at the cabin, Stephen was given toys and clothes. Right away, Parnell is working to kind of control Stephen, keep him busy, make him feel happy, try to get him not to worry so much, maybe even trust him. Uh, gratitude from kids when they're given things is pretty common for most kids. We usually tell them to say thank you, to be happy about it. Uh, we'll talk about this more in depth as we talk about this case, but this is just something um, Parnell does to make kids feel more comfortable. And it's a technique often used by predators. And when Stephen is found, he'll feel bad, specifically stating because of all the things Parnell gave him. He's worried that this man, who he'll eventually come to think of as his father, might think that he's ungrateful. This kind of harkens back to what Stephen's mom said about him being raised to respect authority figures, too, as well, I would imagine, that Parnell, in Stephen's eyes, is still a religious figure, and he feels indebted to him and that he has to be grateful, at least at an early age. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, this is something we teach kids to do, to, you know, to be thankful for the things that they have. So it, it sort of becomes like a habit eventually. And it's not unusual that he would feel that way. I don't know how he felt. He was probably very scared at the time as well because he doesn't know what's going on. And they're telling him initially that they're going to call his mother and see if he can stay the night. So it's hard to imagine what was in his head, but it's just sort of the beginning of trying to persuade him to be more amenable to the situation. And this is important information to understand because, as I said, in Stephen Stainer's life, I saw many interviews where he was upset that people often focus so much on the terrible things that happened to him. 
So when we talk about the things that did happen to him, we're going to try and explain them in a much larger context because it is very unlikely that Stephen would have been kidnapped by a stranger. We went over that last episode. But what he suffers, the abuse, what he goes through is more common to a lot of other people who suffer those same things. So we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. Um, Sexual abuse in America is not all that uncommon. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN, Every 11 minutes, a claim of child sexual abuse is substantiated by Child Protective Services. And according to the National Center for Victims of Crime, one in five girls and one in 20 boys will experience abuse or assault before the age of 18 in America. And I saw all sorts of different statistics. Part of that is people coming forward and talking about it is difficult, so it's hard to get an exact number. Children are most vulnerable between the ages of 17 and 13 years old. And we should say child abuse is not solely restricted to physical abuse. It includes exposure, voyeurism, and child pornography. And the main point being here that being sexually abused is not as uncommon as we might like to believe. And as we said last episode, most of the abuse happens by people that a child or family knows. According to the National Center for Victims of Crime, Three out of four children are victimized by someone they know well. And this is where child grooming comes into play. And this is something Parnell is starting to do right away. And I think child grooming makes it sound like the only people being groomed are children. Here, this is the case. Although there are several others Parnell grooms, Murphy, for one, to get him to trust him and ultimately to sway him to help him. But stranger abductions like this, as we said, are infrequent. So if a child is being groomed in the more common way, then also adults and parents are probably already are also being groomed. Uh, Do you mean that the the parents or guardians of the victim are being groomed by the predator to trust them? Yeah, basically that's it. So that they can have perhaps access to your child or to um, later threaten a child that nobody would believe them. And oftentimes adults don't. I just over the weekend found this article on NBC News about a town in Pennsylvania. It's called, for decades, a sexual predator doctor groomed this community to believe he could do no wrong. A doctor in that community sexually abused many, many children. And in the 90s, three people came forward and the whole town rallied against him, rallied for him, not against him. They put on um, a huge rally. They had their kids wear pins. and some of those kids In defense of this doctor. Right. They just didn't believe it. And he was able to keep doing it, even if there was evidence. And when people get groomed, often there are cases where someone is sexually abused in front of adults and people don't see it or they don't notice it. They just trust the person so fully. And that kind of trust isn't something that happens overnight. So that it's a process that takes a a while. Right. And the same when when a child is groomed um, by a sexual predator, it can take some time. So some of the techniques someone might use to groom a child just to go over them is to first identify a victim, someone often who's at risk or vulnerable. In this case, Kenneth Parnell seemed to target Stephen Stainer. He was looking for someone he could manipulate, and he thought Stephen was angry with his parents. He might be more amenable to going with him. Uh, The second thing is that they often gain trust. So they do things, and what's hard about this is they do things we all do as aunts and parents. They give gifts, um, they listen, they show attention, Uh, They often put themselves in a position of power, priests or um, uh, religious people, as Parnell does, um, cops, as he did before in Bakersfield. The third thing they do is often isolate the child. They'll come up with reasons to be with the child, to separate it from its parents, to maybe take them places. Um, But as I said, that's not always the case. There are instances where abuse happens right in the room with adults. And since they trust this person, they don't see it. And the fourth thing that can happen is secrecy and intimidation. So they can make the child feel dependent on them. Like you have secrets with them that are just normal, but then eventually turns into something else. And then they intimidate the child by telling them that no one would believe them, exerting power over them. And then the fifth thing they use is shame and the secrets and the fear, something that if they tell an adult, it might ruin their life. And then also if they tell an adult, it might ruin the person's life. And since the child has come to care for the person, they might not want to do that. And all of this is really difficult because what's so insidious about it is a lot of these things are just normal things you do when you have a relationship. If you're a parent or you're an aunt or an uncle or a family friend and you're not going to hurt kids, that's not why you're there. But there's a lot of these normal things that you do. You buy gifts, 
you hang out with them, you, you might go shopping with them, whatever it is. Parnell is ultimately trying to create a parental bond. He's presenting himself as someone Stephen can trust, someone he will feel grateful to for giving him things, someone he'll feel closer to because people who give you things must care about you. Murphy will say that at the cabin, Parnell and Stephen would sleep in the same bed while he would sleep on the couch, and he never saw anything inappropriate. If you remember, he would say that he, that never even entered his mind. He fully believed what Parnell had told him. There are mixed descriptions of when the sexual abuse began, due mainly to Stephen's own unwillingness to discuss it publicly or even privately, which is completely understandable. Lots of things will say uh, the sexual abuse happened this first night. Other things I read said it started a week or two later. I don't know that it matters other than the abuse not starting right away sort of fits with how Parnell will treat another child he kidnaps and also with his taking some time to control and manipulate Stephen. Right, because we've talked about when Parnell kidnapped it and raped the child in Bakersfield, there's a lot of time between that instance and his kidnapping Stephen that he's learned learned these grooming techniques or put these in place to be successful. Yeah, when he initially kidnaps the little boy in Bakersfield, um, he isn't planning on keeping him. He isn't keep kidnapping him for a long period of time. He's just He drops him back off in the community. So I think his approach to that is a little bit different. And there is, as we discuss, a lot of unaccounted time. Right. We don't have any evidence that he's been in jail specifically for child abuse during that time, although because he went into a mental hospital and stuff, we think it's possible. But it is possible that he has perhaps hurt other kids and learn from that. I do find it really weird that uh, the news would, it, I mean, there's mixed um, reports of the abuse started the first day or it started weeks later because. I mean, to me, technically, the abuse started when he drove by the house and then told him that his he's going to call his parents to see if he can stay the night. He's grooming already, and that he's just taken his kid away. It doesn't matter about sexual abuse or – I mean, this is just pure abuse of what he's doing to a child. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And the only reason I bring it up is because I think it, we're trying to use Stephen's story to talk about abuse in general. And understanding how long it takes some, or how much goes into tricking or grooming. Yeah, someone to ultimately not tell someone what's happening to them or not come forward or feel comfortable saying something is really important to understand that Stephen goes through this, just like a lot of people went through it. The other thing is, you're absolutely right. I don't know why the paper always has to have these details. Part of it, I think, is when the trial starts happening, things come out. And a big part of the issue with, during the trial, and we'll get to that, but is that because they move around so much, it makes bringing charges against him more difficult. So knowing when some of these things start happening is important for the prosecutors to try and figure out so they know where they can charge him, in what counties, in what places, if they can based on time and that sort of thing. So it's a legal argument of this is the act that happened here, therefore that's the crime we can charge him with. Right. We're not trying to here, I think, say that any of the things that he went through were okay, because you're, you're totally right. The moment he's taken and he's lied to, it's just, it's all abuse. It's horrible. Parnell also began to shift the lies he was telling Stephen about why he couldn't go home. Stephen would tell authorities that he remembers being sad and crying and asking to go home, but he could also tell Parnell didn't like this behavior. So at such a young age, he starts right away learning to sort of set those feelings aside. Fear can be a very uh, useful tool, even fear that doesn't come from physical violence. He does not know who these men are, and suddenly he's reliant on them for everything. Safety, food. Most of us know a look our parents might have and instantly know where some boundaries lie. So kids are often, even really young, good at deciphering that from adults. Kids are also told to respect adults, teachers, parents, police. This is what's so insidious about all of this, and a lot of it sort of mimics just regular parenting. Parnell also tells Stephen that a court granted him custody as his parents in Merced could no longer afford to keep him. This is a lie to me that's really smart, and it comes after the first lie that Parnell tells Stephen, which is that his mom gave him permission to stay the night. And we'll come up upon this several times throughout this story, uh, Parnell is sort of using just regular con men techniques, starting out a lie small that he could stay the night and then kind of ratcheting it up a little bit. To me, this is more of an interesting timeline. How long 
before he said that they can stay the night, and then he said that he has custody. Is this like in the first week still? This is in the first, they're still in Kathy's Valley, so it's in the first day or so. Wow, that's like, that lie just got so huge, so fast. That's crazy. Parnell is good at finding that thing, as we said, that gets to people, that manipulates them. Stephen was living in a family of five in a small house. His family had lost their ranch just a few years prior. They lived in what most people call a middle-class neighborhood in 1972, but his family is blue-collar, and it's the 1970s. The United States had been spending a lot of money on the Vietnam War. Inflation was out of control. The late 60s saw a recession, and I'm not suggesting to you that a seven-year-old understood all of these things or what they meant, but children aren't stupid. They hear news reports, they're in the room when people are reading the paper or having conversations, and they see the world around them. So to me, this lie where he says your family can't afford you to keep you anymore is a lot smarter than just, say, telling him his family no longer loves him. That might have rang less true. And this has to have a big psychological impact for a kid to hear he's so young that his parents, that he can't, he can't stay with his parents. I think he partially believes this. He also might not trust it. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think it's so hard with kids. They need to trust people. They, they need people to survive. There's probably nothing where Stephen ever really had to live on his own, obviously. So he is in this situation where he can't do anything different. So he kind of has to trust him right now. Right. Strange environment, strange person, uh, an authority figure. Plus, as you said, you know, Stevens lived through his parents having to sell one home to move into another one. And so when you said that, I, I would see that ringing more true with him. The other issue is that Parnell says a court has given him custody. He'll eventually tell Stephen, either at this time or a little bit later, that he's adopted him. So you'll notice this is sort of the second authority figure that Parnell is using just with Stephen. And I don't know if that makes it easier to believe, perhaps. Yeah, I would think so. Again, we, as a society, train our our children to pay attention and listen to authority figures and, and what authority is bigger than the court system. You know, I can see people thinking that. And so you have a religious figure saying, your parents can't afford to keep you. They've given you to me. And then I went to a court and I have custody now of you and I'm going to legally adopt you to a small kid carrying a lot of weight. Yeah. And he might be experiencing so much emotional uh, difficulty just dealing with if he believes in part that his family has abandoned him to even really think too much about whether this is true or not. Yeah. Yeah. In one breath, you went from having a family to now not having any family to now getting an entirely new quote-unquote family. During the time he's missing, he doesn't talk to anyone about his family in Merced. And this probably happens for more reasons than that he completely, totally buys this story. At one point, as he gets older, he will say he saw a missing poster of himself and recognized it was him, but didn't tell anyone about it. In the first part of his kidnapping, he will try to call his parents but he doesn't know how to get in touch with them or with the operator. So ultimately, he's not able to. I, I can understand that, that being an issue. I know when I was a kid, after this occur occurred, though being grilled a lot about like what my address was, making sure that I knew my phone number so that if I had to call my parent or like my next to kin's phone number. Yeah, I think that was a big part of the Stranger Danger program was kind of memorizing those things. After a few days had passed at the cabin, the two men took Stephen to the lodge in Yosemite National Park, where they both lived and worked. Yosemite was covered in snow when they arrived. There, Parnell kept Stephen inside his cabin and completely away from other people. Parnell dyed Stephen's hair color to keep him anyone from recognizing him. Both Parnell and Murphy are working at the lodge, so while they're both at work, they start giving Stephen sleeping pills just to keep him from, you know, accidentally seeing someone or going outside. He would also change Stephen's name from Stephen Gregory Stainer to Dennis Gregory Parnell, and he would keep Stephen's birthday the same. It just sort of reminded me when I was researching uh, witness protection for our episode on Michael Ridenour, and I learned there that often people who go into witness protection keep their first names or other various information just because it's so hard for someone to completely learn something new. It actually helps them settle into their new lives. So this is just something I thought about when he's keeping his middle name and he's keeping his birthday the same. Parnell was also able to get documents for Stephen, like a birth certificate. He doesn't always use it during the years, but this birth certificate would list him as the father and a woman named Barbara Parnell as his mother. He had Stephen call him dad and would tell people that his mother had died when Stephen was younger. 
Later, Stephen would often tell people they'd encounter that he had been with his dad since he was two years old. Is the birth certificate authentic, or is it, like, really just look authentic? I'm not sure how he got it, how he obtained this. I know he uses it for official documents, like when to get him into school and things like that. So it it definitely looks authentic. So it could be a really good counterfeit, though. Right, yeah. After a couple of weeks in Yosemite, Parnell would load Stephen into his vehicle, and the two would move to Santa Rosa. They would leave Murphy behind and, in fact, never contact him again. This would begin a seven-year journey of Parnell and Stephen moving to several places around California, while Parnell found odd jobs to provide for them. Parnell's mother would also often send Parnell money, but there's no evidence she would ever meet Stephen or even knew Parnell necessarily had a child with him. The two would first settle in Santa Rosa, California. Santa Rosa is between four to five hours from Yosemite. It's in Sonoma County, which people might think of as wine country in California. It's east of Yosemite and very close to California's coasts. It's also three to four hours away from Merced and an hour north of San Francisco, or depending on traffic. It also sits on a very famous highway here in California, Highway 101, and the 101 runs right directly through the middle of Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is in the Redwood Empire, which is a section of California that extends up into Oregon. So in a lot of Northern California, you'll find areas that that have beaches, but also have really mountainous areas, just just to give you a sense of what it really looks like. And in the 1970s, Santa Rosa is a town of between 50 to 60,000 people. The two would live in different places in the Santa Rosa area for about three years. In Santa Rosa, Parnell would put Stephen in second grade at Kiwana Elementary School. In the paperwork he filled out when he enrolled, Stephen, or Dennis as he called him, he listed himself as his father and said that he was divorced. He also listed Stephen's birthplace as Merced. Um, And this is just kind of how bold he is in his lies. And this is when he starts using the birth certificate. When Stephen is first enrolled, they're staying at a place called the Holiday Inn in Santa Rosa, and then at the El Rancho, which I believe refers to the El Rancho Tropicana, which was one of Santa Rosa's biggest sort of history, history-filled hotels. It was torn down in the 1990s. Apparently, the Raiders would stay there, and what's interesting about this place is that it really is just a motel, because when I heard of all the people who stayed there, I wondered how Parnell afforded it, but it really is just some motel. Eventually, Parnell and Stephen would move into North Star Trailer Park, which is more, it kind of sounded more like a campground, or it reminded me of um, a KOA. So like a, more than your standard campground, but a place where people might want to spend more than a weekend or a few weeks, like semi-permanent? A place, yeah, with people who are actually camping and the people maybe who are in trailers and things like that. Not Not quite a mobile home park, but not quite your average campground. Right. In 1973, Stephen would change schools for a year. Instead of going to Kiwana Elementary School, he would go to Doyle Park Elementary School, still in Santa Rosa. I'm not sure why he switched schools, because based on maps I looked at, based on where they were staying, Doyle Park seemed like across town, where Kiwana was much closer. But he would switch back the following year. I mean, this could be going back with the grooming in a different way of he didn't want really close relationships for Stephen to maybe open up and say what happened. Right, both probably with children, other children, and maybe even teachers. Mm -hmm. In late 1973, Parnell would hire a woman he met on Stephen's walk home from school named Barbara Mathias. Mathias is a difficult figure in this story. She had kids of her own and would often take care of Stephen as a babysitter or or like in a daycare capacity. Parnell paid her $60 a month for this service. Her and Parnell would eventually date and work together in several business ventures. And at this time, Parnell had several businesses. In most of the research, um, it said that he and Barbara would continue also to sell Bibles. So he's not actually part of any religion or a specific church, but he's still using this selling of religious materials to people to make money. They would also sell things at flea markets. It didn't say exactly what, so it's probably, again, religious materials. So maybe I'm just a little confused. Um... The name on the birth certificate is Barbara Parnell, and then he meets this Barbara Mathias later? I think so. Everything, it's hard to tell exactly when things happen, but he has that birth certificate, I believe, when he first puts him into school. So before he would have met Barbara Mathias. So I'm, I'm just assuming that Barbara was maybe a common name for whatever his age was, and it was just a coincidence that he picked someone that he met. It's a pretty crazy coincidence because he does eventually have Stephen call him her mom, too. So 
There were also during this time several requests for business licenses filed by Kenneth Parnell throughout Sonoma County, all sort of within a couple months of each other in 1973. One was for a business called Keep Enterprises and Products, and another called Ad Market, and another called Ad Market of Sonoma. These names don't really give any clues as to what he was doing or selling. And there are times he's doing bookkeeping and things like that, so I'm not really sure what these businesses are. But they are filed within just like a month or two of each other. I wonder if that was part of the the his con. If he came up with generic enough names, he could use them for whatever kind of business con he wanted to perpetrate on people. Yeah, they seem really like con Gen- businesses. I don't know. Yeah, like generic names. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm just wondering, do you need a business license to sell Bibles? This might have just been so he could sell Bibles at a flea market. Anything in the background or a sign to make his flea market sales look better? It might also help him get stuff like wholesale, you know, or or to prove to people that he's actually a legit business. He could take out a loan or... Yeah, just the fact that they don't really have... He didn't use religious names for the companies, though, is kind of interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Especially if he's using that as, like, he's selling himself as a religious person. He'd want to be able to tell people his business was also religious. Also, why wouldn't you, you know, a lot of times you'd use your name. Yeah, and weirdly, they were the business licenses were also filed with the same address of a mobile home park in Santa Rosa called Mount Taylor Mobile Home Park, but with two different numbers for the mobile homes. So as I said, this happened within a few months of each other. So either they lived here and during the course of a month or so switched mobile homes, and I've seen nothing that said they lived there. Or perhaps given Parnell's history, he might have done accounting for the park or something. Just the whole thing seemed kind of odd. Yeah, it's possible he could have even just lied completely and it's it's a mobile home park and just grabbed a random number. Right. And obviously Parnell's kidnapped someone, so fraudulent businesses are the least of the important things that we need to talk about. But it just goes to speak what the kind of man he is, just sort of 100% all the way around, just sort of conning all sorts of people. Matthias helped in these ventures, Barbara Matthias, and we'll be talking more about her because her role in all this is really, it's just confusing. Later, she will tell police that she helped Parnell in a business, although someone who remembers them from this time will say that she was the one selling Bibles and other religious books and that Parnell didn't do much of anything. She's never arrested, but does talk to police. There are accusations made against her. Later during the trial, a psychiatrist will say that Stephen told him that she participated in the sexual abuse Parnell inflicted on him. It also seems she had tried to help Parnell kidnap other boys in the Santa Rosa area. She's never arrested for either of these things. Um, There's a three-year statute in California for kidnapping, and there's no there aren't boys who come forward who say that there was they were almost kidnapped. Is this reported by Stephen after he? Yeah, the abuse is reported by Stephen to the police after he is um, found. But she also talks to the police and tells them some things, and she tells them that she helped Parnell. Oh, she admits to it. Yeah. In 1975, Parnell and Stephen begin living in a mobile home in Willits, California. Stephen will go to Brookside Elementary School in Willits. Willits is just off the 101, and it's a small town north of Santa Rosa. It's in a county called Mendocino County and only has about 4,000 people living there in the 1970s. It's still really small now. Only about 5,000 people live there. There actually is a horror movie that's currently streaming on Netflix called Welcome to Willits. Oh, we'll have to check that out. Uh, It is on my queue, so... Mendocino County is the next county if you're traveling north of the coast of California. This is a county Parnell and Stephen will move around in, but stay in until Stephen is found in 1980. Mendocino is both coastal and mountainous, just like Sonoma, with lots of ranches and farms through the hills. Matthias moves with them to Willits and actually lives with them there. She also brings her five-year-old son to live there. She also has a few other kids, and they come in and out, but the five-year-old lives with them. During this time, they're making a living by selling Bibles and going to flea markets still. They would only live together about nine months, but during that time, they would also move a second time into a converted blue and gray school bus Parnell found in a wrecking yard in Compshi. They would live in this in Fort Bragg and Noyo, so he's still doing a lot of moving around. Fort Bragg is still in Mendocino County, but it's right on the coast. It's a small city with only a little over 7,000 people living there now. It's also where one of my favorite movies was filmed, Overboard. During Matthias's time with the pair, Stephen would call her mother, and she always claimed that she never knew he had been kidnapped. She said that she saw birth certificates and other records that would indicate Parnell was Stephen's father. After about nine months, the two would break up, and she would leave for unknown reasons. Parnell would tell people that she left him when she would, quote, run off with a hippie, 
So there's sort of a pattern here with Parnell and his lies about the women he dates or marries. Right, but it's it's hard to believe that she didn't know something. I mean, she admits to the trying to kidnap two other children for him, or not necessarily for him, but to kidnap. She's a really hard figure to pin down exactly because she's never she never arrested or tried for anything, so it's hard to know exactly what she knew or didn't know. I agree with you. It seems suspicious that she would say that. And she would do something in um, an upcoming episode that will just make everybody really angry. The place they lived in also asked them to leave because the converted bus they had had been turned into a camper and used butane, didn't follow site regulations. So when Barbara and Parnell split, she actually takes the camper with her. Hello, and let me tell you about Twisted Britain, a podcast on true crime in Britain with a sprinkling of the weird and the macabre. Your hosts are me, Bob Dale. And me, Nadine Royal. We're a couple of friends who met in the pub, and we developed a friendship based on our mutual love of booze, podcasts, and pub quizzes. We met in the Settle in Sterling, and that's where we record. Each week, we both tell a story of something twisted. One long one, and one short one. And we decide who goes first. Based on the flip of a coin. So if that sounds like something that would tickle your fancy, you can always find us wherever you normally find your podcasts. Just search for Twisted Britain. Thanks. Bye. In 1975, 90, 1976 time period, Parnell would take Stephen to live in Comshi, California, in Mendocino County. Comshi is a really little area. It only had about 159 people living there in 2010. It's also really isolated and mountainous. They would stay in this general area approximately three years. While living here, Parnell would work for Wells Manufacturing Company as a bookkeeper. This is something he did often, as we said, so he's selling Bibles, but he also, every now and then, he works like he did in Yosemite, sort of as a bookkeeper, and he will supplement his income this way. This is a company that made dental equipment, and Parnell got this job through the state employment office. While at this job, he told people that he had a wife prior to moving to Comshi. The story he would use was that the two of them had owned and operated a religious bookstore in Fort Bragg, and when it went under, the two of them separated. And this is just an example of some more of his lies. The people he worked with here liked him, as they seemed to at most of the places he worked. He'll come to be described as a quiet guy who kept to himself and really didn't make friends or talk about his family. Though most people do know he has a son. Lots of places he works will describe him as creepy and unable to look you in the eye. People he worked with would also note he would get angry when mistakes were made. He liked things a certain way and sort of would have trouble adjusting. And I just found this interesting because most of the places will say that he was just a really nice guy. But then after all this is found out. There's always the... The afterwards of, oh, he's creepy, that kind of stuff, you know, they probably didn't think that. Well, they could have, but I mean, they don't, no one probably said it that much back then. You Yeah, you always find it after the fact that somebody gets arrested for a crime that everybody comes out of the woodwork almost like, oh, see, I knew I was smarter than everybody else. I knew he was off. Well, and it's interesting that they use certain things that I think you hear a lot. Like, he didn't look you in the eye, which is, does not make you a criminal. I mean, lots of people are right. not adept at that, and it doesn't mean they've done something wrong. So it's the same sort of stereotypes, even though Parnell is a, is a terrible person. Stephen will often report that life for him while he was with Parnell was complicated, but much of it normal. And I don't want this discussion to cause anyone to think that we're okay in any way with kidnapping kids or sexual abuse. Those things still happen. But in researching this, I found many interviews where Stephen was upset that people only focused on the bad parts of his life and didn't see sort of the reality of it, which is that, yes, he was sexually abused, but he also lived a very normal life in many ways. And that's true of people who've been victims of crimes, even crimes that go on for long periods of time. They're real people, and they're much more than just the sum of these horrible crimes. In 1979, Parnell and Stephen moved to a secluded ranch outside Manchester, California, Manchester is another town in Mendocino County. It's very small. In 2010, there was only about 195 people living there, and they move not directly in town, but outside Manchester. The ranch they stayed on was a sheep ranch, and it was very secluded. It was on Mountain View East Road, and this is a road that extends from east from Stornetta, California, to Boonville, California, in about a 26-mile stretch. And in 1980, investigators will note that there are only a few places scattered along the length of the road. The family who owned the ranch had a cabin at one end of their property and had difficulties with vandals, so they needed someone to stay in the cabin and watch their land. It's not unusual for people to live on ranches like this and will often live rent-free, and they kind of keep an eye on things. This is what Parnell did while living here. 
The home itself would not have electricity all the time and had an outhouse, but there was a lot of room for Stephen to hike through the hills. He had a little dog named Queenie that lived with them and kept rabbits, pigs, chickens, and turkeys, and they even had a goat. Stephen had friends, and he went to school. Prior to moving to Manchester, Stephen attended 5th and 6th grade in Fort Bragg and then graduated from Mendocino Middle School. He enrolled at Mendocino High School and attempted to keep going there by hitchhiking every day to school, but this was an hour or so away from where they lived in Manchester, and it was too far a distance. He enrolled as a freshman at Point Arena High School in Point Arena. Depending on where the cabin was on Mountain View Road, this was still a good distance for him to travel, and it appears it was very much up to him to get to and from school, often by hitchhiking. And also a local rancher would give him rides to a bus stop that was eight miles away from their cabin, when that rancher would take his own kids to school, and then the bus would pick them up and take them to high school. So he was really far out in the middle of kind of nowhere. At school, Stephen was considered quiet and smart, but had trouble with his grades, mainly due to his poor attendance. He had played on a baseball and a football team at another school and tried out for the basketball team at Point Arena High School, but couldn't figure out transportation home after practice, so wasn't able to stay on the team. Sadly, many of the schools Stephen attended were schools that the Stainer family sent missing flyers to, but no one recognized the young child. By the time Stephen was 14 years old, he's actually six feet tall, so recognizing him from the flyers would have been a difficult thing to do. Another thing, since we already know what happened, it might have just been that it was on nobody's mind. The picture was old, and he's already six feet tall. No one's thinking about looking for... They still have the picture of the child... You know, you you grow older, kids can look totally different. So it's just thinking about it now, it's no one probably was even thinking about it at all. Well, people tend to have a short attention span, too, when it comes to certain tragedies. The flyer comes to the school, and then years pass, and then they, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, maybe. And no one also... even knew if he was alive or dead. So, I mean, it's been years. No, it makes sense that they wouldn't be able to recognize him. Um, The Stainer family is still sending out flyers every year. They still believe that he's out there somewhere. Oh, so these schools are repeatedly getting flyers every year? Right, but they only have that picture of him when he first goes missing, when he's seven. When he's seven. And so he's grown, and like you said, kids look totally different, even a couple years older, and this this is almost seven years. Several of the schools he attended would later report that they didn't have a birth certificate in the records. As they moved, it seemed records for him would become sparse each time he moved to a different school. There was a birth certificate initially, if you remember when we talked about that. And apparently this wasn't really unusual for kids at schools, especially for the time. There were a lot of teachers and principals and stuff who said, that's not really all that weird, that we wouldn't have all the documents. It never raised any questions that he might have been kidnapped. This part of Stephen's life has gotten a lot of interest because I think after we everything we know about how people work, it still seems hard to believe that he could be kidnapped and abused and still given so much freedom. And there are a few things to remember here. The first is that we know Stephen has been kidnapped. And if even during the years Stephen may have questioned or wondered about it himself, to him the reality is much different. From his perspective, for most of his life, he's living with the person a court assigned him to live with, someone who he is supposed to be with. For him, his father. I know it's hard for me to hear even you say that Stephen would think of this person as father after everything we know has been happening to him. Right. But we're privy to the information of his kidnapping. Right. And it's interesting to see the different perspectives in this case, because obviously for the family, for Stephen's family, the Stainer family, he's been kidnapped and that's a huge violation. And they're experiencing this far differently than him, who unfortunately, has come to accept Parnell as someone he's supposed to be with, someone who's adopted him. And he was little when he got kidnapped, so he sort of changed his life to fit that mold. Right, all predicated on a lie that was told to him when he was kidnapped. Right, but he doesn't know that that's a lie. Right, he's built built this up, or, or this reality that he's living in, regardless of what started it, is he's having to suffer through it. Right. The other thing to take into consideration are the methods that Parnell used to keep Stephen under his control, even if Stephen wasn't physically under his control. The words you're most often going to hear in cases of kidnapping or holding people are brainwashing and Stockholm Syndrome. These are two controversial terms for professionals. Brainwashing appeared in the DSM in 1980, kind of during the big time of cults and things like that. 
and it's considered far from scientific fact. And researchers and doctors are even reevaluating what happened in some of the more famous cases of Stockholm Syndrome. There are several things I read that talked about newspapers and news people using these terms often way before even a professional is involved, especially now. And they're really big terms in pop culture. There's a lot of movies about brainwashing, books, TV shows. Obviously, news people shouldn't be making diagnoses like this. And these terms have kind of been accepted by the culture at large, even though they're not really used professionally to diagnose people with, oh, you've been brainwashed. So we're just going to go over them, each one, and then kind of talk about Steven Steiner and what actually happened to him. So Stockholm Syndrome was coined in 1973 after the bank hostage situation in Stockholm, Sweden. It's really common, as we said, in popular culture. There's movies and TV, but it is not recognized as a medical condition. It was first coined by psychiatrist Dr. Frank Ockberg when, in 1973, four people were taken hostage at a bank in Stockholm by two people. The standoff with police in the bank lasted for six days, and the victims sort of formed a relationship with their captors when they would be nice to them. So the victims were often tied up, or they weren't allowed to do things, and when, the, when their captors would let them, give them some space, or give them, you know, let them go to the bathroom, they would feel thankful to them. And a lot of this is predicated on the idea, like a lot of psychology, that something isn't normal for people to feel. So if you're in a bank and you're being held hostage, it's not normal for you to ever look at your captors in a different way other than being perhaps angry or scared of them. But instead of looking at it as Stockholm Syndrome, it's maybe these people thought, why are they robbing a bank in the first place and then got to know them? So there might be a backstory in the first place. The, hostage, the hostages might think, oh... I, I kind of get why they're doing this in a way. Right. They spent several, I mean, six days with them. The, ho- the people who held them hostage as well said that when they first went into the bank, they were willing to just murder people. But after those six days, they would never would have been able to do that. So it kind of went both ways. Okay. A lot of this is just we looking at these things and saying that some of the stuff we do is just human. It's not someone messing with your brain or changing who you are. But you're ex- like you said, you're experiencing things. So what you're saying is the biggest issue with this is that people call it a syndrome. That it's it's not a disease. It's just simply how people react in extreme situations. Right. I think a lot of people spend time thinking, if I were in this situation, if I were Steven Stainer, for instance, how would I act or how would I behave? And the thing is, it's impossible for anyone to actually look at that situation and know until you're in it. And so when people look at these bank victims, people who are being held hostage, and see that they start to sort of look at their captors differently and start to look at the police perhaps as the enemy and are worried they might do something or they think that they might not react that way. That's not the normal way for someone to react. So what's going on here? But the thing is, is it may be exactly the normal way to react. It may not be something odd at all. It may be how most of us would react in that situation. And the other issue is that there's not a lot of science to back this up, mostly because there's not a lot of people to go to and research they haven't most of us have not experienced this there's no diagnostic criteria to say oh you've check check you've you have stockholm syndrome and a good example of this is a kidnapped victim named natasha kampush who was kidnapped at 10 years old in austria in 1998 she was held in a cellar for eight years and escaped in 2006 when she when she escaped police went after the person who kidnapped her and he killed himself When Natasha finds out that he has passed away, she goes and lays a candle at the mortuary, and there's a lot of press there, so they kind of judge that act, and they start saying that she has Stockholm Syndrome, Um, and she rejects this, and so do actually a lot of kidnap victims. But this is a quote from her, quote, I find it very natural that you would adapt yourself to identify with your kidnapper, especially if you spend a great deal of time with that person. It's about empathy, communication. Looking for normality within the framework of a crime is not a syndrome, it's a survival strategy. And for us, the larger question is if Stockholm Syndrome did exist, would it apply to Stephen? So one of the things that has to happen is that people have to genuinely believe that they're under the threat of death. And I don't think Stephen, despite what he went through, despite all the terrible things at any time, really thought that that was a possibility. He was, he was being abused, but not there wasn't a threat that, he, that Parnell would kill him. Right. The other thing that you experience, as we talked about, is some small act of kindness from the captor. Stephen does experience this. Um, we'll talk about it. He, his captor gives him presents, Christmas 
presents. Um, he also gives him animals, a dog that he cares deeply about. So the other thing that people who believe Stockholm Syndrome was or is an actual syndrome is that you have to be completely isolated from outside influences to the point that the only point of view that you see is your captors. And as we know, Stephen, he went to school, he had friends. So he's not just isolated with just Kenneth Parnell. And on top of lots of victims saying that they don't believe Stockholm Syndrome applies to them, partially because it implies that there's something about them that would cause them to feel a certain way about their captor. Um, a lot of professionals, or most professionals is what I found, do not believe in this. So the other term that gets really used often is brainwashing. And this is a term, as I said, was put in the DSM in the 1980s, but is not now a widely accepted term for professionals. And in fact, lots of professionals don't like how people use it sort of publicly, news people, in movies and TV and stuff like that. And it is widely accepted. You can look in all the research, you'll still hear it pretty commonly used. Um, and what's considered brainwashing, I think a lot of people are really talking about being persuaded or being coerced, but that's not actually what brainwashing is. Those two concepts are concepts that people agree do happen. People can con you into doing something or trick you or force you to do it through um, violence or fear. But mind control or brainwashing is not accepted as something that actually happens or has any scientific evidence that it currently exists. Brainwashing and mind control became really big ideas in the 50s when America started to worry about China and communism. And they believed that perhaps they had developed a way to control someone's brain, to take a person and change them into completely somebody new. You might have seen this concept in something like the Manchurian Candidate or Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And during the Korean War, this sort of took off when POWs would sometimes sign something or admit to doing something that they hadn't actually done, would say Americans had done something they hadn't, hadn't actually done. And people wondered how someone could undergo such a big change. And one of the things that they didn't really look at was torture. The POWs were tortured and the effect that that has on getting people to say what you want. So in the 1980s, the American Psychiatric Association includes brainwashing. And this comes at a time when they're, you know, we're afraid of communism. And we've also had a lot of cult activity, things like Manson and Jonestown. And the reason they added is because they're seeking to answer a question similar to Stockholm Syndrome. Why someone would do something that seems unexplainable? Why would someone join a cult? Why would they become a communist? That doesn't really seem like a normal thing for someone to do. So you have to come up with a reason why someone would do that. And they come up with brainwashing. So in the 50s, psychiatrists used a concept called behaviorism as the main method behind mind control. And this is sort of the idea that the mind is blank slate at birth and shaped through social conditioning. So you can shape a mind to do anything you want sort of like a rat who gets a treat every time a bell is rung. And this started programs like MK Ultra. I don't know how many people have heard of that. But the problem with this is that there's not a lot of science to back up that brainwashing actually exists, that fundamentally changing someone's brain can happen. Yes, you can use persuasion and coercion. Even when people join cults, a lot of that is what's happening. But we're using the idea that it's not normal for someone to believe something. And we can look every day. There's normal stuff people believe, fad diets or fake news, whatever it is, that they're coming under social influences or different con men type techniques that don't really have anything to do with changing who you are. And just like with Stockholm Syndrome, a big part of this for victims is that if you say someone is brainwashed, you're sort of putting a blame on them, that they not participated in it, but something fundamentally happened to them, that they would do something they wouldn't normally do. They were weak in the first place or something like that. So they, they don't want to hear that because they're, they're human beings. Something, right. something was wrong with them to allow that. Right. And they're the only people who've been through whatever it is they've been through. So the thing to really remember is that if you're hearing about someone who's gone through something, everyone is not you. Even if you think you know what you might do in a situation, you may not act that way. But also, not every other person would do the same thing that you would do. Not all victims react the same way. And that what's normal for you is just not normal for everyone. So when we're talking about Stephen, there's not just one psychological term or anything that we can use. In 1981, during the trial, and this is, we have to remember sort of a high time for the, these ideas of brainwashing, a psychologist will say that he was brainwashed. He will testify to that fact. But I think when you're looking at Stephen, we have to, we've talked about it before. He was younger. He didn't realize he had been kidnapped. So it's not as if Parnell has to 
convince him that what he believes to be true isn't actually true. He's told a hodgepodge of lies. He's told a court has given Parnell custody of him, and he believes that. He's taught to respect authority. And he spent when he's found, he's 14 years old. So he spent half his life with his family in Merced and half his life with this new person who he has come to think of as his father, despite all the terrible things that he does to him. The other thing that Parnell does to manipulate him is to give him things. When Stephen is found, he will talk about feeling bad for turning Parnell in because of all the years of Christmas presents. He doesn't want to seem ungrateful. These are two people who come to be a sort of really dysfunctional family, despite the fact that we know he's been kidnapped. And I, I feel bad keep saying that because I don't want people to think it's okay that, he, that he's been kidnapped, but this is just a normal life for him. He doesn't know any different. Right, we're trying, in your descriptions, it's really hard for anybody to wrap their mind around the fact of what Stevens had to put up with, what he's gone through, both physically and emotionally. And until you really said it, it didn't, I don't think, dawned on me that it really is. Half of his life has been spent with a person who kidnapped and tortured him, and he thinks that's normal. Yeah, I think that's what's so interesting about this case, is when you think about it from his perspective, there's so much about that we've gone over, that we've told you about, that is just really unlikely to have happened, being kidnapped by a stranger being held and not murdered. But what is really likely, unfortunately, is that he lives a life with someone he considers his father who sexually abuses him. And that's what's sort of, not normal, but unfortunately statistics point to something that a lot of people go through. It's a common thing that survivors of abuse have had to deal with. This this idea of being continually abused by somebody they see as a family member or, or a trusted individual, and then having to Sur- I mean, survive that. Right. Another thing, going back to the psychologist who said it was brainwashing, like we've said before, we're, we're talking about these cases. We don't have lawyer backgrounds. We don't have police enforcement backgrounds. But this psychologist, most likely, he doesn't have a background in being kidnapped. So he's, it's a different perspective. It's an outside perspective because he doesn't know what Stephen actually went through. Right. And as I said, even in the 80s, when this is something that's being talked about more often, there's not a lot of science to back this up. So like you said, it is his perspective after listening. And unfortunately, when Stephen is found, people like they did when we talked about Natasha Kampush, ask a lot of the same questions. How could somebody be kidnapped for this long and not tell someone? How could they go to school or on field trips or hang out at someone else's house and not tell someone? Or hitchhike. I mean, you hitchhike to school. I can see myself saying that, like you're hitchhiking, just keep going. But it's seven years. Right. And it's a hard question to answer, but it's not one that we have to answer because the only person who knows is Steven. He went through it. There's a lot of things impacting him. There's the way Parnell treats him. He considers him family and his dad. There's also, uh, he sort of manipulates him emotionally. He gives him a dog. And as we know, Steven is really, he really likes animals. He had a ton on the farm. Um, and that's something he can use to take away or bring fear with him. It's continuing that torture in a way that unless you're, maybe unless you're in it, you wouldn't be able to understand. And he does other things. I mean, he sort of alternates giving Stephen a lot of freedom, but it's a fake sense of freedom. So at a young age, he starts giving him alcohol and marijuana and other drugs. He starts, he never has uh, a bedtime. They're out in the middle of nowhere. So even though he can hitchhike places, it's still, he's not connected with a lot of he's people isol- in the same way. Yeah. So I think he's giving him, like, he thinks he can do anything. He doesn't have a bedtime. He doesn't have to be home. He can go to school if he wants to. He doesn't have to. But it's not, it's just a fake sense of freedom because Parnell is always controlling him, partially with abuse. Stephen will say that he didn't really hit him a lot, but obviously there's sexual abuse. And the other thing that comes to light that I think is really important to take into account is society. Stephen has suffered a lot of sexual abuse, and he does not want people to know about that. He tries to keep that to himself for as long as possible because he doesn't want people. He feels ashamed and he feels judged. And that's a way that Parnell can really control him and his actions. And sexual abuse often leads to feelings of intense shame, depression, PTSD, and anxiety. According to Lucy Berliner of the Sexual Assault Center at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, quote, if you believe you have no alternative, you just learn to live with it. Your sense of right and wrong, your sense of reality gets distorted, essentially for the purpose of survival. 
So someone experiencing sexual abuse like Stephen is, find ways of coping through it by sort of setting aside what's going on and just living the rest of your life. It becomes something that's normal for him, something that happens, but not something he's necessarily focused on every day. He's just surviving. He's getting through it. And we're going to talk for a minute about specifically what boys and men go through when they experience sexual abuse. According to the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, or RAIN, sexual abuse can actually happen to anybody. So you don't have to be a certain age or a certain gender. You don't have to be straight, anything like that. It can happen to anyone. But there are different aspects that affect boys and men a little bit differently. So men often feel shame and doubt when they, can't, when they aren't able to fight off an attacker. And even little boys sometimes feel this way, even though they're still kids. Partially because of the social idea that men are stronger, they should be able to fight back. So this is sort of, they feel like it's their fault. There's also a lot of biology involved. Um, men have things, they get erections or ejaculate and they can't control that. And that's a biological response that in no way indicates that someone consented. And the reason we're going over this, because it's a difficult topic, is because we've tried to do this in all our episodes, is connect Stephen's story to something larger. And as we said, the one thing that he experiences that a lot of people experience is abuse. And we don't often talk about all of the ways that that affects people. And we should in order to, to get rid of some of the stereotypes and the stigma attached to it. Some of the things that boys and men experience when they've been abused or raped are anxiety, depression, PTSD. Often they experience eating disorders. They will have difficulty going to places that remind you of the assaults and the abuse. They may question their sexual orientation. And if you can imagine going through this, especially when you're Stephen's age, you're just sort of learning who you are. People will feel like if perhaps they are gay or bisexual, that somehow it was their fault, even though it isn't. And the two have nothing to do with one another. Right, of course. But you're, you're going through so much in society. There's so much stigma attached to right. the things that happen to you, especially because a lot of what happens is out of your physical control. And that does not make it okay if you're a child or if you haven't consented. They'll also feel a sense of being less of a man because they've lost control over their own body. They'll have trouble sleeping. They'll feel on edge, unable to relax, and a huge sense of blame and shame, which I think we really see in this case. Withdrawal, isolation, just worry about telling people, worried about what they'll think of them, fear of reactions, fear of being bullied, which unfortunately Stephen experiences when he finally is, tells people. And just a fear that people won't believe you, that it actually happened, which we talked about grooming. So some th abusers work really hard to make sure people don't come forward, um, to make sure people trust them. And honestly, society takes on, they do a lot of the work for them because people are judged and they don't always believe you. And that makes it really hard to come forward. If you do want more information about any of this, you can go to the RAIN website. Or if you have questions or you want to talk to somebody, you can call their number, 1-800-656-4673. They're also affiliated with an organization that specializes in helping boys and men deal with abuse and rape. It's called One in Six, and we will put this up on our site as well as our social media. There's a way to talk to someone online who's been through abuse or rape, and they know perhaps maybe what you might be going through or what someone you know might be going through. So they're a really good resource. Steven Stainer was taken as a child and had his world turned upside down by Kenneth Parnell. While being kidnapped by a stranger was statistically very unlikely, the abuse and control he suffered is all too familiar for too many people. In Steven's world, he was sexually abused by the man he considered his father. But what is more unlikely than experiencing abuse, control, or having your reality reshaped by a stranger at age 7 is that years later you would break through all of this to help someone else. In 1980, Kenneth Parnell would take another boy, and Steven Stainer would earn the moniker of hero when he would make a decision to reach out from the darkest parts of his life and shine a light. We will end this episode here. Next episode, we will cover the kidnapping of Timothy White and the aftermath. Here's our cold case for this evening. On June 22, 1986, Stanley Howard was sleeping in his home with his wife and daughter when an intruder took a knife from his kitchen, walked into his bedroom, and stabbed him in the throat. The Howard family lived in Merced, California at 631 East Girard Avenue. Stanley Howard chased the intruder down his hallway, 
but was unable to catch him. Stanley Howard died while chasing this intruder. His daughter, who woke up during the murder, has written a book called The Lost Night, a daughter's search for the truth of her father's murder. We put a link for the book in our social media. If you have any information on the murder of Stanley Howard in Merced, California, you can send a tip online to the Merced County Sheriff's, which we will also link on our social media page. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. We would love for you to give us a rating on the podcasting service of your choice. We also have a Patreon page if you'd like to support us. If you would like to contact us, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Cali True Crime. You can also email us at calitruecrime at gmail.com. We'd like to thank our quality control chief, Melanie Duncan, a.k.a. Scooter. This episode was produced at Chateau Walnut. Thank you.